Hello, everyone. Uh, our final panel will focus on world affairs. We will touch upon Turkey and the Middle East, protests around the world, and finally, the influence of social media on our world affairs. First, we will have Mr. Brian Katuas, who will give the opening of this panel. Mr. Katuas has done extensive research in the Middle East and has worked and lived in numerous countries, such as Israel and the Palestinian territories. Additionally, during President Clinton's administration, Mr. Katuas worked with the National Security Council and U.S. Department of State and Defense. Our discussion will also feature three panelists. First, we will have Mr. Saeed Onal. He is the president of the Red Rose Inter Intercultural and Educational Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that promotes diverse cultural settings in the United States. He serves on several, several other organizations' boards, including the Advocates of Silence Turkey and the World Affairs Council of Harrisburg. He will go more in depth in discussing Turkey. Then we will have Ms. Hagir El Sheikh. Ms. El Sheikh experienced domestic violence and escaped from the political violence in Turkey in Sudan. Currently, Ms. El Sheikh is the CEO and founder of a staffing agency called HSE Staffing. She also started a nonprofit organization called Tomorrow Smiles Incorporation, which fights domestic violence. With Ms. El Sheikh, we will have an interesting conversation about women's rights all around the world and women in Sudan. Our final panelist will be Dr. Mehdi Norbosh. He is a professor at Harrisburg University and is widely published. He's working on a book about nationalism and democratic change in Iran. We will ask him to di discuss global economics, Iran, and worldwide, worldwide health. We really appreciate and thank all the panelists for taking the time to talk with us. Now we will start this panel with Mr. Katulis, who will provide us with an opening on the Middle East. Hi, it's great to be with you. And I really uh, feel uh, lucky to be part of this uh, panel. And I'm looking forward to, to hearing uh, the other panelists and their thoughts on, on their areas of expertise. And also uh, listening to your questions because I, I thrive on engaging um, with uh, groups uh, like yours. And um, I'm really excited about your future and your, your interest in uh, international affairs. Um, I'm Brian Katulis. I'm a senior fellow at a think tank here in Washington, the Center for American Progress. Mm. Um, at my core, um, my main job is to try to remain committed to facts and analysis, to go out into the world and listen to people and offer uh, an independent take uh, through books, through articles, uh, through sometimes testifying to Congress, uh, to try to shape um, the policy discussion here in the United States. And I've had the pleasure of living in um, uh, many of those countries that were listed, including Israel, Palestine, uh, Jordan, Egypt, and I travel quite regularly, um, at least in, re recently until the pandemic. Um, and on any given day, you know, my research and analysis is informed by talking to people from across the spectrum. So just this morning, I had a breakfast with a top advisor to the new Israeli prime minister who's in town to see uh, the, the Biden administration. And I had lunch with now the ex ambassador to Tunisia, which we can talk about. But while we were having lunch, it was unclear whether he was still uh, the uh, Tunisian ambassador to the US, I should say, whether he was still in that position. And, and last week, I spent the week in, in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, meeting with think tank um, officials and, and uh, academics and some, some government officials. I just wanted to spend maybe uh, two, three minutes offering an overview of what is the Middle East. And even the, the phrase Middle East, uh, some people um, debate because in, in some ways it's very much um, uh, a phrase that is used, uh, originally used by some of the colonial empires, including the British empire to describe a particular region in the world. When we use it here in America or in Washington, it often refers to sort of that, um, uh, those lands stretching from Morocco and North Africa all the way across into Egypt and uh, sometimes includes Turkey, sometimes not, depending on the different bureaucratic definitions and all the way into Iran and sometimes extending to Afghanistan and Pakistan. The key thing, I think, in the, in the snapshot um, of this region of the world there, there, I would offer three main points. One, it's a very vibrant, um, young part of the world. So what you see today, uh, I think won't be what we'll see in 15, 20, 25 years, simply because 
there is a generation uh, that's been in power and that's been dominant in many of these countries that is simply overwhelmed by what is a largely younger population in most of these countries. And it's very vibrant. It's, um, you know, it's often sometimes called the Muslim world or part of the Muslim world. But if you use this phrase, uh, some people who are maybe um, Muslim by birth, but maybe not as by faith, uh, take offense. It's a very rich and diverse region of the world. Um, and it's a very complicated mosaic by and by. Um, so I think it's an important uh, point uh, to, to start with that it's very young and, 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 and very vibrant and changing. Um, the, the second thing I'd say is that some of these changes uh, could come quite abruptly as we saw 10 years ago in what was the Arab uprisings. Um, basically discontent with the economic situation, with the social status, um, the, the struggle that I think most people feel day to day. And I think our panelists from Sudan can, can talk about her, her own sort of experiences in fighting against uh, some forces that, that, and practices that, that I think have, have demeaned a lot of people and tried to keep people in a certain place. And I think there's a strong desire for change, even in the most autocratic of, of systems, uh, uh, like Saudi Arabia that I was in last, last week. There's a desire to see things move forward uh, in that part of the world. And that's, I think, another key feature is that it's young, there's change that's coming, and part of your task, especially those youth leaders, if you're interested in this part of the world, is to try to help understand what's going on and help explain what's going on over there and not use just simplistic uh, frames that essentialize things, that boil things down just to religion or a clash between two different strands of Islam or um, uh, modernity versus the, the past. Uh, it really is, a, uh, like our country here in America, very complicated. Uh, it, it varies from country to country. And that's, I think, another key feature. And we're all stopping this brief overview. Um, and it gets a little bit towards sort of what I do in terms of US policy, but it's also a description of uh, the region itself in terms of the, the power structures that exist. When you look across the Middle East, um, and many people, when you say Middle East, sometimes just think either the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or the tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and what I'd say is that the, the region itself is a complicated uh, mosaic of a competition of influence among the leaders uh, and, and the countries of, of that region. Um, uh, some people highlight the tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia, for instance, and say this is a clash between Shia and Sunni Islam. And again, that has features of it, but it's essentially about power and trying to project power within that region and a competition for influence among those, those countries. And understand that a lot of what we talk about here in Washington or in other countries outside of the region, we often look at it from just our narrow perspective, whether it's uh, oil or uh, terrorism or insecurity uh, or certain uh, countries that, that, that key parts of the United States support, whether it's Israel or some of the Gulf states like Saudi Arabia. Um, but, but ultimately, uh, what's happening in the region is a complicated uh, uh, confluence of multiple forces, these pressures from within that I talked about, the, the youth and others wanting change against uh, old systems in their own countries, these tensions between countries trying to project influence. So a lot of what you see, and I'm happy to talk about any of these countries, but a lot of what you see in countries like Lebanon today um, is, is a story of uh, tensions within that country, but then also uh, countries within the region, Iran, um, Saudi Arabia, and others, uh, trying to actually um, have influence in these, these smaller and sometimes poorer countries. And I think the task uh, in the United States and what I try to do is to try to move beyond what has been an over, overly military-focused approach to the region, where for, for far too many decades, uh, the US has looked to the Pentagon and sending troops to places and defined a lot of its interests in terms of what our military does or uh, where we can sell arms. And where I think the task is for what, what I try to do is help people have an appreciation for the complexities of these societies to respect um, their background and heritage and understand that America and other countries like America need to engage 
in different ways, especially in the people to people engagement, especially in going out and just listening um, to, to what people want and how they want to change their own societies. Um, America certainly in the last couple of years have gone through its own periods of turmoil and tensions internally. And imagine a, a scenario where in the fights between the two different political parties here, outside actors tried to come in and then tried to weigh in and, and shape things here inside of America. And I think that that leads to, you know, when America has tried to do this in certain places like Iraq or Palestine or other places, it's, it's led to more problems um, 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 than, than good, especially when we use mostly our military approach. So that's a very simple overview. I'm happy to go into any of the particular countries. I know there's uh, perhaps questions about the recent conflict between Israel and Hamas in, in the Gaza Strip in, in the spring, um, questions about the nuclear negotiations with Iran and ongoing incidents. But I just wanted to offer a very, I think probably oversimplified snapshot of what is a very complicated regional world, but one that I think is changing and I, I hope changing for the better in part because of uh, the millions of young people who are, who are looking for change uh, inside their own countries and in that part of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will now start taking questions from our interns and our first question will be by Deepti to Mr. Katulis. Good evening, Mr. Katulis. Thank you for coming to speak with us today. How has social media affected COVID-19 in the Middle East or around the world? That's a great question. And you could even start with social media affecting COVID, the COVID situation here in our own country, um, because our, uh, some of our leaders in Washington, including President Biden, but then Republicans and Democrats in Congress have raised concerns about the role that uh, social media uh, uh, companies play like Facebook and Twitter in not doing enough to make sure that the facts about COVID and the best way to stop the spread of COVID and the best practices, make sure that the facts rather than conspiracies or, or falsehoods that are put out there. So especially in including in our, our own country where we've lost so many of our fellow citizens here in America, and I wanted to start here in America, this is a, a vaccine, very complicated challenge where the government authorities are trying to lay down certain regulations to keep uh, people safe and communicate that. And sometimes through, I don't know if you've ever been to the fun house uh, at a carnival, but sometimes I, I see Twitter or social media, something I engage in as this fun house mirror that sort of twists the image or the actual facts. And that's just sort of in our own country. Um, when you come to uh, places like, again, the Middle East, and guess, because we have so, so limited amount of time, I wish I could have walked through the uh, almost two dozen different diverse experiences across the Middle East and North Africa, because it, it varies from country to country. Um, but, but in many places, that same challenge I've described here in America, where people are just trying to wrestle with uh, what I call truth decay, this decay of truth and what's actual facts. Um, it's a similar challenge in the Middle East. The, the, the difference right now, and we're a year and a half into this pandemic, at least in the world, is that uh, because of vaccines and because of our situation here in the United States, we're so far ahead of many of the countries in the Middle East, not all of them, but some of them um, still are in their infancy in the fight against uh, COVID. And that's in part because of lack of resources. So I, I mentioned today I had uh, lunch with the Tunisian ambassador to the U.S., who's now the ex-Tunisian ambassador to the U.S. He just texted me and said he got official notice. Um, and people aren't really paying attention to this as much, but the hospitals and the situation inside of Tunisia right now are really um, the, the sort of scenes that we saw in Italy uh, last year or so. Um, they're living the things that we saw also in certain parts of America and are now seeing again. Um, and some of that is related to social media. A lot of it is just related to simple basic resources. We, we're lucky, I think, to live in a country here where if you, you want to go get a vaccine and you feel like it's the right thing for you and your family to do, um, you can do that. In many countries, that's not the case. But social media, uh, I'd close on saying not beyond, beyond COVID because it's such a great question, but beyond COVID, I think um, what I saw in the revolutions in the Arab Spring of 10 years ago in Egypt, uh, Tunisia, um, several other societies, it, social media was quite a useful tool for tearing down the old orders, for getting rid of old, old dictators and powers and sort of challenging authority. 
What it's been less good at in many parts of the Middle East, and I'd say it's the same situation here in the United States, it's been less good at bringing people together to in coalitions to get things done. So this is one of the, I, I'm not a social media specialist myself, I, I engage in it, but it's a challenge of the technology and I think the algorithms, which tend to drive people apart, even if they're of the same country and tend to feed on sort of either political differences or ideological differences. And my hope is that in, in America, but then also in places like the Middle East that have, ha that have big divisions in their society, society, that people could try to use those tools to actually bring people together in the way that we're being brought together by Zoom, not, Zoom, not that Zoom's a social media technology necessarily, but, but rather than foster division and suspicion, uh, foster sort of a broader coalitions that get things done in the world. Thank you, Mr. Katulis. Uh, Anthony will now ask a question to Mr. Onal. Again, thank you, Mr. Katulis, for that amazing insight on the Middle East and things that are going on. Just to branch out a little bit, um, this is to Mr. Onal. Can you speak on the situation of women in Turkey as well as please give us an update on human rights in Turkey, which was once one of the most promising democracies in the world? Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, thank you for your interest um, about Turkey. Um, I usually try to ask questions back and I want, I want to do that to all our interns and maybe uh, everyone participating. Why Turkey and democracy in Turkey is important to you? Um, as you're thinking about that, wh why would that be an important topic to discuss? And, and then we will, we will maybe understand a little bit better about why it should be better, right? You know, um, the, the woman in Turkey is really as, as everything else, uh, they're not in good shape today uh, because uh, we were just discussing something, you know, uh, the airlines, uh, the airports, uh, now Turkey now facing uh, a huge fire, wildlife fire in, in, in the South Turkey, and now it's taken all over Turkey. Huge, a lot of people. Animals are, are not safe in Turkey. Why is that? Because once something starts going wrong, there's no accountability in, in the leadership and there's no rule of law. No one is safe. So um, in Turkey, um, there is, there's a first struggle of democracy. You know, Turkey has been, you know, for a couple hundred years now, trying to, uh, even during the Ottoman Empire, trying to establish a, a, a true democracy, right? A form of democracy. Uh, but then, you know, I, I can say we have, we have made a success story out of this. But most recently, uh, what Anthony says, you know, Turkey has been looked as as one of the democracies, you know, that is in the region is, is being an, as an example for other countries. Um, what, why, what happened in the last five, 10 years, you know, for, made a big U-turn. So um, over 170 media organizations have been shut down. The schools and companies have been confiscated and closed down. People were jailed. Turkey is really, um, one of the uh, top countries, actually not one of the top countries, but it is a top country in the world uh, for journalists being in jail, including China, right? You know, think about the level of democracy in Turkey. So if, 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 if there are two types of people now in Turkey, one is you are with the current regime and the government or you're against. And if you're against, well, you're in jail or you're, get, you know, you're getting killed, or you're being sent out, or you're forced out, really, you, you can't stay in there anymore. So that's the main problem. The rule of law is no longer uh, exist in Turkey. I mean, you know, if, if, if you look, there is, there is actually a, um, a data that I have, Freedom House report on freedom in the world, this is 2018 report, Turkey from, uh, from being in the top, now it is in the bottom. Actually, dramatic declines in freedom in the last 10 years, Turkey is 34% and number one country in the world as far as decline in democracy and freedoms. So, you know, there, there are, of course, this, this question, Anthony, has, has, there are so many impacts of it. You know, I'll just quote you uh, 
I think I can share my screen. I wanna, I wanna show you guys something. Um, this is Turkish president's, uh, if you can see my screen, this is what he's known famous to say before he became this powerful. And unfortunately, this populist policies that he followed and, and the, the, the really uh, human rights issues that we have had in Turkey made this person, uh, current president of Turkey, uh, really gets the obsolete power. And, and now he is, you know, off the street car. Is the, Turkey is no longer democracy. Turkey is not a free country. Turkey has no freedom of press. Turkey has no freedom for women. Turkey is, has no freedom for journalists or just simply, you know, today, uh, something that I have, I have, I have read, uh, like to, 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 to um, talk about, uh, this uh, fires in Turkey, um, President Erdogan, instead of taking blame and responsibility and accountability, you know what he said? He says, that this is the responsibility of the municipalities where he lost election first time in the last 25 years in the municipalities of the big cities. So he puts the blame back on those people who are running the city governments, but the, the forest, obviously the fire is a fire, right? Doesn't matter really who, who's supposed to do it, but he's in charge, but he doesn't take blame um, for anything he does. This is the corruption, absolutely, you know, absolutely that, that is the main uh, deal. Uh, when he was running, if you don't know about his his uh, political background, but he he was a he was a broke uh, a politician really. He was a career politician. He had never almost never had a real job, but this guy was running for uh, mayor of Istanbul when he first started this his his journey. Uh, he's known as showing his wedding ring in a meeting in his campaign, saying that this is the only thing I own in life. And if one day you hear, he said to the crowd, that I own more than this ring, the wedding ring, that means I stole it. Today, he is one of the richest uh, presidents in the world. So uh, obviously, this has a lot to do with what's happening in Turkey. This gentleman that who doesn't believe in democracy, he's an Islamist. Uh, he used the really, uh, the, 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 conservative people in Turkey had had problems with the state many years, 400 years now or more. They could not have their freedoms. They didn't have freedoms in Turkey. Certain people had freedoms, but certain people didn't. Th those issues he used to gain the power, now he cannot be, he cannot let go because now he has used all that power he gained um, to eliminate the opposition. Uh, and turn Turkey in, in, a, in a big prison. So this is where we are with Turkey. I hope I, I was able to explain a little bit, but there's so much to talk about Turkey and, and so much needs to be done, really. You know, uh, President, current President uh, Biden has never been a friend of Erdogan. When he was a vice president or during his campaign, he had not really shown any, any uh, sympathy to him because he kind of, was able to call him for what he is. However, uh, a couple of months ago, the first time you know they met um, at, at a gathering, uh, I think it was a NATO assembly, um, and and United States have given a big task of really protecting uh, airport in Afghanistan, where U.S. Army is currently is pulling out and Turkish army is supposed to do this dirty work. But now all of a sudden, Erdogan is back to a good boy list for, for United States. So that is, I think, something we can do to talk about. Like those people who are dictators, who are making the life hell for everybody around them in the region, they, they are not kept accountable in their own countries because there's no rule of law, but in international communities, they're not being kept accountable. As long as there is a benefit relationship, now they get another freebie. Now he is in power and he will, it seems like he will continue being in power and do what he does. So 
that's that's it for now. If you have more questions, we can we can chat. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anal. Sahidi will now ask a question to Ms. El Sheikh. First of all, thank you so much, Mr. Anal, for that insight on women and human rights in Turkey. And now I want to thank Mrs. El Sheikh for coming here to speak with us. So my first question is, can you give us some updates on the situation of women globally? And maybe tell us your story. You need more than half an hour for that. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna, uh, first of all, thank you all for having interest in uh, politics and the region where there is so much trouble and need help. Uh, I'm gonna piggyback from uh, uh, Brian and, and Sait, uh, um, Sudan, is for well, some of you who might not not know where Sudan is. Sudan is in the Northeast uh, in Africa. Um, it's been run by dictatorship for 30 years. And you're gonna hear this with everyone that's gonna talk to you today. Uh, the biggest issue is having a dictatorship government, having like what state call it, um, you know, a, a rotten head. Um, running the whole country, which will cause the whole body to rot in and corruption, et cetera. Um, Sudan is uh, just had recently a revolution. Uh, Mr. Bryan did not mention that in the uprising. Uh, that was a part of it from the social media. A lot of people were able to follow Sudan and see the beautiful, peaceful protest that ended a 30 year regime. Uh, Al Bashir and his regime uh, run the country uh, based on what they call it Islamic, which is not actually. Um, and it was more than a dictatorship, uh, like Said said, forced people to seek immigration, including myself. Uh, if you are in opposition, you lose your life, you, you become detained, tortured and you know my stories um i have a memoir on amazon i if i go through my life journey it's going to take up the whole time but i grew up in sudan i was the youngest of seven uh, brothers and two sisters um, my family were politically active they were involved in the politics of sudan and growing up from an early age i learned uh, that as a woman we don't have any right um, that's, that's the first problem. And then the second problem, human right was basically none. Um, and, and I'm talking about in the 19, from the 1989, when the current, the previous government uh, took over uh, by a military coup, um, they, things start to decline. Even the small amount of freedom that people had uh, in the 80s, um, they were gone at, at some point. I was... Um, basically one of the uh, few female uh, spokesperson for the Democratic Forefront uh, Party in Sudan, uh, from high school all the way to college. Uh, I led protests, rallies, and trying to educate people and, and having a better life for everyone. And that did not go well with the government because first of all, as a woman, you shouldn't be talking, let alone leading and fighting. And, um, you know, talking about human rights was not something that anyone will go for. So I was tortured, detained. I was hung from a tree, beaten with anything that you could imagine. I have a scar here to tell the story. My head was bashed open. Uh, I mean, I can go on and on on the torture that they used. Um, some of it I did not personally experience, thank God, which is rape. Uh, women in that region um, face rape, uh, activists face rape. And in the war zone, they use that as a form of punishment and power. Um, so if you think about um, what's the worst thing could happen to a man in that region, multiply it by 10 times. And that's what women go through. Uh, if you Google Sudan, you will hear horror story. Uh, those are not story or movie. Those are real life. And I lived uh, the first 20 years of my life um, in, that, in that area. Um, I was able to escape uh, with the help of the UN and seek immigration. And I stayed almost eight months in Egypt before I got settled here in the US. During that time, as a refugee, you face so many other issues. Um, women face sexual harassment, uh, like I said, rape earlier, uh, domestic violence, 
all kinds of violence. Uh, gender inequality is part of the theme in Sudan and maybe all that region. And I think uh, Mahdi and, and Said can, can agree to that. Whether you talk about Sudan, Iran, or Turkey, uh, you will find there is so many violations that basically either led us to leave, escape um, in search of um, safety, or you stayed and we lost so many people because of that. Uh, the revolution was a beautiful thing that happened and al-Bashir regime was gone um, two years ago. But then because of, there is no basics for, for not just democracy, but there is no structure. And us as the United States or any uh, first world country, what they call it, uh, we did not step to help. Um, we normally step to create war or help with weapon, like Brian said, um, our role uh, is different. We, we say that we are there to help with the peace and everything, but we don't, we don't give people the, the tools. And, and that's not just for women, that's for everyone. Uh, you cannot expect a, a country to succeed, uh, continuing and following with the revolution if they don't have a guide or a map. Um, now, uh, Sudan, um, gov Sudanese government currently, they're struggling to figure their way. Uh, some of the corrupted regime were able to get their back, um, their self back into the picture and became um, powerful. Um, we weren't, they weren't able to get rid of so many corrupt people there. And I was telling Said and Mahdi earlier, al-Bashir is still awaiting trial and it's been two years. So justice is not served there. And um, this is just in general about situation in Sudan. But if we wanna talk about uh, women issues globally, like I said, this is a very, very wide, bright uh, question and topic. Uh, women is still face uh, human trafficking. Um, those are some of the issues that I am passionate about. Uh, labor, um, you know, sex tra being sex trafficked, uh, unpaid labor, child labor. Um, women don't have access, or everyone in, the, in that country doesn't have access to healthcare. And Brian was talking about uh, how here we have the option of taking or refusing the COVID, and you can go and get your vaccination. Over there, people want it to be vaccinated. They want to be healthy, but we don't have anything. We keep, uh, we keep the vaccination here and, and most of the um, wealthy countries, uh, and we have half of our population doesn't want to be vaccinated. But we hold that, and the rest of the world are not able to get it. Uh, so health system is down the drain. I currently um, went to Sudan. My mom was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and we had a firsthand experience. I wrote about this on my Facebook. Uh, I use social media uh, heavily to expose and I use my platform. I have a talk show um, to expose everything going on, not just in Sudan, but worldwide. Uh, the health system in Sudan, uh, my mom was not diagnosed with cancer. They found out after they opened her up. Um, she was at fourth uh, stage, like end stage cancer. Uh, the doctor did not know what to do. They didn't have equipment to close up her stomach. So they basically stable. I'm sorry about the graphics, but um, it was a horror uh, movie. And I, I filmed all of that and I kept it. Uh, the problem is there is nowhere to take it to. I filed a, a complaint with the Department of Health. Um, they got rid of that person and everything else he was working on. So you have to start all over again. It doesn't go up the chain. There is no justice. So I use social media uh, to basically alarm people and, and alert them that if you have a loved one, you need to be mindful to what's happening. I work in the medical field and I was able to help my mom as much as I can and to see the wrongdoing that they do. Many people don't even have that knowledge. But again, what is their option? Um, they don't have money to go out, like in a different country to get treatment. Um, their only option is to accept what they have. So it is not bright. Uh, the picture there is not bright. Uh, it's painful. Um, we're trying to do our part. And that's where you guys come in. 
education, raising awareness. Uh, I am big on education. Uh, we cannot change any uh, harmful tradition. We cannot change inequality. We cannot make a difference if we just put a law uh, in place and we don't follow with it. Uh, having laws to protect women, I am a victim of female genital mutilation. I'm not sure if you all are aware of FGM, but it's heavily practiced um, during my time growing up, and it's done by women for women to women. Um, so the uneducated women continue this cycle, just like the understanding of the abuse. I'm also a, a domestic violence a survivor. Um, like I said, my list is long. Uh, everything that bad could happen to a one person, it happened to me. So I'm, I'm able to talk to you from experience. But um, in Sudan, female genital mutilation, uh, it's, we, we have laws in place now. But people don't follow with the laws because in their mind, this is the norm. This is the tradition. Uh, the, the woman's body need to be protected. They need to not be able to feel, uh, not knowing that this will affect them during birth uh, in their life uh, in general. Um, so the big thing we can do to help women, not just in Sudan, but all over, is to educate, to raise awareness, uh, to have those harmful tradition uh, disappear or, or help into putting light, using social media, using your platforms, talking to your families, discussing what uh, issues that matters to you and how other people can help. And that's how we can make a difference. Uh, there is a lot that I can go over, but I don't want to take all of, all of your time. And I'm more than happy to answer questions. Uh, but this is a topic. Hopefully, this will open up your mind to go look up on uh, violation, violence uh, in Sudan or in Iran or Turkey, as an example, and in that region, and see what you can do um, to help spread the word and, and, and raise awareness. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. El Sheikh. And it was very interesting to hear your story. And it's terrible what they're doing in Sudan. So our next question will be from Kennedy to Dr. Norbaksh. Hi, Dr. Norbaksh. My question is, what is the current situation in Iran? You are muted, Mahdi. You're absolutely right. I'm mm. sorry. Thank you, Arjur. You're welcome. Uh, you have a government in Iran that is uh, authoritarian to bone. Uh, that is exactly what a saint is talking about, or Al Bashir was in Sudan. But perhaps we are a little bit luckier than the Turks. Uh, in, in, in that regard, that in Iran there is a fight. Uh, in Iran, there is a boycott of the election. There is in Iran, the all leaders who are not giving up. And the authoritarian regime in Iran have not succeeded to totally, like for example, Erdogan in Turkey, uh, to totally uh, shut everything. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it doesn't, of course, give any credit you know, to the government, but the nature of the Iranian society uh, perhaps is a little bit you know, different to some extent. Not that the Iranians are you know, uh, much more qualified in that sense than, for example, the people in Sudan and the people, for example, in Turkey. But the circumstances in Iran, Iranians, they carried out a revolution about you know, 40, 40 years ago. And one of the slogans of the revolution was freedom. And that is a base, that is a foundation, that is a justifiable uh, for, for a lot of people in Iran to raise that a slogan, uh, to very much you know, emphasize on it. And based on that a slogan, based on that demand, uh, delegitimize uh, the system in Iran. And you saw it, for example, in the last election a couple of you know, weeks ago. Uh, out of close to about 100, uh, well, out of 40% of the eligible voters, less than 40% of the eligible voters participated 
in the election and they boycotted the election. Then in Iran, there are venues that they are you know, fighting. I'm not saying, you know, we, we can, you know, go to the end of it, you know, quickly. But as a person who, of course, studies Middle East, studies, you know, different countries of the Middle East, uh, in the case of Iran, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful uh, in all of the cases. Let me tell you this. In all of the cases, I'm hopeful because people in that you know, region, they are fed up by authoritarianism and authoritarianism has to end you know, somehow. And it's very unfortunate that uh, since you know, the beginning of the Cold War in the Middle East and in that part of the world, uh, the United States uh, took the side of authoritarian regimes. And very much, if you look at, for example, the Saudi Arabia, the argument and discussion for the Saudis and the Arab countries was this. We get your oil and we give you protection. That was the type of exchange that they, that they went through. And you have different governments in the United States that they go through phases. You have the Carter administration that is very much, of course, supportive of the human rights. And during that phase uh, of the history in the Middle East, the Iranians succeeded to overall carry out a revolution. But United States at the end of the day is very much thinking about own, own interest. And what I call it, not human interest because there are two issues that you have to think about it in the international relation. And these days, uh, and I think Brian you know, agrees with me, we can talk about these issues with the political and cultural side of the globalization. I give you one example in that regard and you understand it. Uh, close to about 20 years ago, uh, many people in the United States, they did not have that much knowledge about the Arab-Israeli conflict, yes? But now at least, and now in the United States, Europe, of course, is better you know, in that sense. Close to about 60% of the Americans, they take into heart the, 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 the Palestinian side in that you know, conflict. And, and that is a huge overall uh, development in, in the United States. I'm working with a, a lot of the you know, Jewish organization like the you know, JS3 and other that Brian, my friend knows him you know, very well. And this is really a good, good organization uh, to, uh, it, 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 even, even in the United States is what we can say, uh, in those of course, you know, countries, uh, the people do you not know, know that uh, authoritarianism is a problem. And hopefully in the United States, uh, and in, of course, European countries, they also understand that in all of those countries, if they support them morally, they don't have to intervene, they don't have to do anything else. As you know, Saint said, uh, then the uh, Biden administration had a different approach to Mohammed bin Salman, yes? Then, then copy that you know, approach to Turkey too, copy that approach you know, to other you know, countries too. And, and a little bit, you know, help. And for your information, uh, I, I want to show you that I'm not talking hypothetically. There are a couple of the you know, organizations that are taking polls in the Middle East. One of them is the Arab Bar Barometer and other organizations that are taking, you know, polls in the Middle East. Look at it. Every, the majority of the people, even in Saudi Arabia, they are thinking and they are talking about democracy and they are very much dismayed by, of course, authoritarianism. Then one of the security issues in, in, the, in the Persian Gulf at the moment and that neighborhood and the Middle East is the freedom and is a democracy. And of course, the threat to all of those is authoritarianism. And instead of overall, you know, thinking about suppressing, uh, for example, the ISIS or the you know, so that you have to do it and we have to do it. And all of us, of course, you have to do it, but you have to have to go, you have to go for the root cause. And that is overall a problem that the people in the Middle East, they have with their leaders and they, they need really outside support and outside you know, type of moral you know, support in that you know, context. Uh, not, as I said, I, I'm not you know, advocating for military intervention or none of you know, those things, but people in that part of the world, they are fed up. 
and people are looking for support from you know outside because i promise you if those governments become accountable in that you know part of the world then that is overall a huge huge of course solution to the problems that they are facing i'm sorry i i, I it took me a lot thank you um did it, kennedy did i answer your question yes sir it did. okay thank you. okay thank you so thank you anthony has another question for dr norfosh okay why don't uh, you dump, why don't you dump some of those questions over Brian? Brian is sitting, you know, very <laughs> comfortably over there. Why don't you dump in the south of Kashmir? I'm sorry, I'm just joking. I'm, try, we, I, I'm we, trying to get his help. I'm trying we, to get we, his help. We we could both we could both answer. Why don't you answer first? Yeah, um, this can be that's this perfect. Can be, this yeah. could be both Dr. Norbach yeah. and um, yeah. Mr. Katulis. Okay. Um, so the question is, what is the state of the world economy as we are slowly emerging from COVID? Uh, Brian, you go ahead, please. <laughs> no, be believe me, I, I, I want to see your answer. I want to see your answer. So um, I actually track a bit of this, and I did a book called uh, The Prosperity Agenda many years ago, and I'm very interested in the, 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 the economic foundations of global uh, cooperation. And it's very important. We often in America just look at what's going on in our own uh, neighborhoods or with our own jobs or states or even the country. And, and it's a really important question because the, I see even in a period where trade has declined and there's more skepticism about trade um, because of the internet and because of so many different variables, the supply chains are much interlinked. We're much more interlinked together than, than ever before, despite sort of recent deglobalization and uh, other things. What essentially has happened, and it's happened inside of America, but it's happening in the world, is that you actually have two, the, the inequalities that everybody, I think, has been made more aware of here in America and in the world, um, those inequalities, unfortunately, have been deepened by the pandemic, um, both inside America, but let me go to your question in the world. Those developed economies um, that uh, were better situated because of uh, vaccines, because of resources, and also because of their dominance of the global uh, financial system, especially the United States, they're pulling ahead and roaring pretty strongly in their own economies. Um, in fact, so much so that in, in America, in Europe, um, less so in China, but it, it is a dynamic in China, there's, there's concerns about inflation, the prices of things going up so much because demand is pent up and people are coming back into the world and they've got money in their pockets. So it's a tale of two, two, two worlds in a sense, uh, those developed economies versus those that aren't uh, so much uh, developed. And uh, those that have actually been lagging behind for years, they were doing uh, quite a lot better, I think, over the first two decades of this century because uh, general growth was lifting many uh, billions of people out of poverty. Um, those gains in what people at the UN have called the, you know, uh, sustainable development goals, mm -hmm. those gains mm -hmm. have, have now been lost, in and mm -hmm. especially in developing countries like India, um, in large swaths of Africa. And right now we're in a period of uncertainty where growth is uh, sort of roaring in these big engines of the global economy. And those, those societies that had been left behind are being left even further behind. Yeah. And the last thing I'd say is that if you look at recent global meetings, whether it's the G7 group in, uh, that met in Europe with President Biden in June or the broader G20 group, they're, in my view, and this is a bit of my own opinion rather than just analysis, they're not doing their job in helping bring uh, the rest of the world along, where we had a bit more of a consciousness raising in the first part of this decade where people were focusing on the environment and helping the poor of the world who had fallen behind. Uh, in a sense, uh, the rising nationalism and the inward looking dynamic we've seen here in America and other places have made many of the rich countries basically say, we've got to take care of our own. And mm -hmm. I don't think that's a sustainable strategy in the, in the long run because we're, we all live in this world together. And a lot of the problems um, that may seem distant in places like Africa or India uh, actually know no borders. And we actually need to, to work together to, to actually use our resources to help others uh, who are poor and less fortunate. I, I totally agree with Brian that if one thing 
I showed where we are in the in in this world at the moment is the unevenness of development, unfortunately, and the vulnerability of the healthcare systems and other systems in different parts of the world. But but let me tell you this: you, you remember I discussed with you guys in one of those uh, I think session that you know we had why it is important to elevate the world because poverty in the world overall means lack of education. Power, lack of education means overall disease. Lack of education means uh, immigration. Lack of the education means not opening up the market for you if you're of course a developed economy. Lack of education means overall that you cannot uh, overall uh, the inputs that you put in, in other you know, parts of the world for the sake of market or other things, it, it remains you know, uneven. And you don't want to live you know, in that world because that world is very, very fragile. That world is very insecure. And you have to think about you know, overall you know, that world. If you, are a, you have a capitalistic system and you want to overall, you know, open up the market or you want to open the market, you want to, you know, capture the market in different you know, parts of the world. Uh, these days is not that, you know, you create a product and you just, you know, ship it over there. You have to be in those, you know, societies. You have to build, you know, infrastructure. You have to think about, for example, look at, you know, Africa, Hajar, you, you overall, you know, perhaps, you know, confirm what I'm saying. Africa is not the Africa that was 20 years ago. Africa is totally a different Africa. Well developed, uh, well developed. I'm talking about Africa's economy is very different uh, from, for example, 20 years ago. And you have to have answers for that even and evenness. As long as we do not think about you know those issues, then as I said, then we have you know problem. We have security problem. We have immigration. And I give you one example to see what I'm talking about. Did you look at you know, the situation in Syria and the wave of over, overall, you know, wave of the immigration close to about 2 million to Europe, uh, out of, you know, 11 million that they were uh, overall, uh, they were refugees in Syria, close to about a six, seven, a 6 million of them, of course, they are dislocated inside Syria. The other 6 million, they are dispersed uh, among, you know, or, uh, Jordan, uh, Turkey, Lebanon, and Europe. And, and you don't want to you know, that kind of disruption. And with the immigration, you have the rise of, of course, political right in Europe. And as all of you know, political right is a threat overall you know, to the institution of democracy. As you saw it, for example, Mr. Trump was in this country, was a threat overall you know, to the institution of democracy in the United States. And you do not want to create those kind of you know, disruptions in the world, you are living, as Byron said, we are interconnected. You cannot forget about, of course, the fate of the others in different parts of the world, because in one way or another, that affects you later on. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Katuas and Dr. Norkbosh. We will have Deepti ask the next question to Ms. El Sheikh. Um, that question's already been answered. So I'll be asking a question to anyone. How influential- Ask a question. Can I ask a question from Hajar? Hajar, sure. do, do, do you know where the, the origin of your name goes? Yes, it's Hagar in the Bible. Ishmael is his wife, I believe. Okay, and, 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 and she was what? She was the mistress. No, but, 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 but she was a black yes. lady. She was a black lady. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and it's and, actually, and, I think it's a mountain also in Saudi, I, yes, I heard. Yes, um, yes, yes. What I want to say that at the origin of that, you know, what we call it Abrahamic religions mm -hmm. that comes, you know, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, you didn't have discrimination based on the color of his skin yes, yes. that that was overall you know i'm sorry i, oh, yeah. I disrupted no, no, no. your be, job I, I want I, I want those guys you know to know that those things that are ugly today 
they do not have any origin in our belief and religions and values. And of course, in, in a modern world, of course, with, with the notions of mutual respect and you know, democracy and those things. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, don't be, don't be. I am not a religious person. And I came to that conclusion uh, maybe 30 years ago after research. I read all books and, you know, um, I have my own personal opinion. We can discuss that That's at perfect. another time. Yeah. Yeah. But in Sudan, you might, some of you might not know that um, the northern you go in Sudan, the lighter the color is. And the, like when you go down to South Sudan, which is now uh, a, a different country, a different country. There were a war between Sudan, uh, like the North part and the South, yes. they made it look like a religion, but it was oil, gold, it was all greed, and that's the base of yes. every war in this world, basically. Uh, people try to cover it up with something else. Uh, but discrimination is not, it doesn't just live here. Uh, some of you just know the United States and might not look and say, you know, people are discriminated against uh, just only here in the U.S. No, even the, black, the countries that are in Africa where we are all considered black, but I'm lighter skin than someone who grew up in the South close to the equator. Mm -hmm. um, you know, very hot, dark mm -hmm. skin, mm -hmm. uh, tall and different complexion. They were discriminated against. Uh, they were used as slaves. Really, mm -hmm. I am not mm -hmm. making up yeah. stories, yeah. but uh, that was part of uh, the South trying to gain their independence from the North. Uh, just like here in the Civil War uh, back back in the days, but um, I am considered black here. I am considered white in Sudan, yeah. <laughs> ironically. So you don't, you, 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 you don't know where you fit <laughs> some, some places. <laughs> um, but uh, that, that's another thing that uh, may be interested to know about that region um, and to know that uh, people have did discriminate against people from the same country because of the color of this, their skin, because of their sexual awareness. There are a lot of LGBTQ uh, community in Sudan that were killed, stoned. Um, if you have sex outside of merit, uh, you get stoned to death. Uh, that's, you know, most of those practices, it go back to uh, maybe the stone ages or, or people relate this to religion, but there is so many lies that people say about all the religions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it doesn't exist. Like there is certain things that in the Quran, for example, or in the Torah or the, uh, the Bible will say specific punishment for specific actions. But people translate that in their own way. And mm -hmm. that will cause um, like the, the terrorists, that cause the extremists in, in Islam or in Christians or in any other religion per se. Religion. But... Um, and, and that's another reason why I, I don't I'm do religion. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Somebody <laughs> wanted to ask you a question and they just sure. started the whole thing. Yeah, go ahead, please. Somebody wanted to ask a question from El Sheikh. Who was she that? She already yeah. answered the question I was going to ask. So instead, um, how, I'm going to ask this question to everyone. How influential has social media been when it comes to the fight for rights in your region. I think I said something about Sudan mm -hmm. and that social media played a huge part in showing people the peaceful protest, the beautiful revolution, and also a documented for crime against humanity. Um, the Janjaweed, which is now unfortunately currently the second chair in Sudanese government, the new government, uh, he was. Um, one of the wanted for war crime, uh, Himeti, his name. And if you know about the Jinjaweed, that the cause of the genocide in Darfur, mm -hmm. um, you know, they uh, raped women recently. I'm talking about 2019, uh, 2018 revolution in Sudan and uh, uh, the sitting in, in the Al-Qaeda in Sudan, the military area. Uh, they did a peaceful protest, sat there, and the Janjaweed uh, militia uh, came and burned the whole place with million people in it. Um, they um, put a heavy stone in 
activists and revolutionists feed and drown them into the Nile River. They they did an unspeakable crime, and I'm talking about last year, I'm not talking about the 80s or 70s. Social media recorded some of this. Some people were recording until the point they died, they were live on Facebook, which is a powerful thing and horrible to see, but at the same time, it gave us, um, uh, what you call it, it, it gave us a stand where we can show this and say that's why we want those people to be brought to justice for for um, crime against humanity, for rape, torture, for killing, burning villages, and for genocides, basically. So I think it's a very powerful tool, but you have, like Brian said, to know how you can use it. It can go both ways. It in my country, it give you yeah. false information yeah. and it could give you good ones. In, in my country, that tool is very much politicized, politicized in the sense that they are using it very, very effectively. I'm talking about opposition. I don't know how many of you know now that there is an, a, a platform. I don't know, Hajar, if you know about it or saying a telegram. You heard about it? Yeah. Telegram in Iran has close to about, out of 80 million population, 40, 45 million in Iran, they have Telegram. Yeah. And they communicate overall, you know, with each other, they mobilize. There is a new tool, I don't know if you know it or not, Clubhouse. Yeah. <laughs> My God, Brian, in the Iranian case, we have political discussion for 12 hours. Yeah. I am invited into a meeting this coming Friday. It is 12 hours of discussion. And I told them guys, choose the two hours that you want me to be over there. I cannot yeah. stay over there. <laughs> Joyce, I cannot stay over there for 12 hours. <laughs> give me the two hours that you want to give me. But believe me, that is a tool that they are using. As you know, anybody can enter the, 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 the clubhouse and there are any discussion. And you have overall, you know, people who are, who are down or people who are, you know, invited to the, to the top to talk. But the level of respect that people have, you know, for each other and the exercise of democracy in that, you know, platform is amazing. Believe because it's me, not regulated by government. It Remember is not. That. It is not. And, mm -hmm. and, and let me give you one example to see that. Uh, Brian, you know Hashemir Rafsanjani in Iran. Yes, you, re you remember that. He has a daughter, Faize, who is very vocal. Joyce, you know him. Yes? Yes, yes. When he comes on Telegram that once, you know, I share the platform with him, uh, each Telegram house at the moment, I think, fills with 5,000 people. Wow. You, have, you have to close it and you have to open another room and uh, connect that room to this room. Then you, you do that. 20, 25,000 people participate. Amazing. For eight, eight, nine hours. And that lady is sitting over there for eight hours and going to questions and answers and debates and, you know, anything that you can imagine or any other you know, reformers or any other uh, person who is of course in the forefront of the battle for democracy at the moment. Of course, the conservatives, they have their own you know, platform too, but yeah. the reformers in Iran, because they, they, they learned how to react with each other and be respectful, then they entice a lot of conservatives to co come to those you know, sides and learn from them, learn you know, what you know, the discourse is. Discourse I'm talking about, the package, about you know, how we want to reform Iran. We don't want to you know, dismantle the government. We don't want to disrupt you know, this and that. We are not you know, for, uh, what is it, uh, the, the, what is it a, a coup or you know, a revolution. Or, you know. It is a, an amazing tool at the moment. And it, it, it is something, it is something. And, and I'm telling you, 5,000 people in one room to come together, and then that's not enough room. You have to open, you know, three, four, you know, more rooms. Uh, 25, 30,000 people participate in debate and, you know, discussion. That is amazing. 
Yeah, if I could just add one thing, and then I'm sorry, I'll have to uh, yeah. depart because I, yeah, I had a note. Depart. Yeah, yeah, right after I make this point is like, I, I am on balance positive about all of these dynamics, especially when it gives voice to people and gives them yeah. new sources of connection. The two caveats I would um, note, and I already said this uh, a bit, but one is that if these tools are simply just forums for people to come and vent, but then not have uh, a directed action, meaning build coalitions, build common cause. Yeah, um, That's one challenge. And I've seen that in places yeah. like e yeah. Egypt where truly yeah. liberal, young, forward-looking people 10 years ago uh, did not really use the tools, nor, nor was the environment open to it, truly. To, to help them sort of create a new country for themselves. And now to this day, in my view, the country of Egypt, which I love, I love the country of Egypt, but it still has not met the potential yeah. of its own people. Um, and then the second, and it's related to the first, is that unfortunately, you know, and you know this in Iran in China and Saudi Arabia, I just saw this too, social media is used as a tool of repression um, in some ways to really squash dissent and to do it in such ways that is very aggressive using not just, you know, uh, the tool to track down journalists like Jamal Khashoggi and murder them, but then also to deploy herds of people, of trolls against those who expressed dissenting views, whether it's people of different sexual orientation or women or just a different background. And it's a tool that uh, early on when it first appeared was seemed like a, a tool of freedom, freedom uh, in Facebook and expressing of ideas and the, uh, some of these revolutions were called the Facebook revolutions. And now, unfortunately, the tools have been turned. And I'm, I'm sure you would agree against those and used as tools by the, the old order to sort of squash dissent. And that's that's one. Uh, Brian, one, one of the things about, you know, my country that I want to give you a hopeful note. In Iran, people are so active in social media that whatever barriers the government is trying to create, they break it they break it. They were filtering this, they were filtering that, and they are anti-filter mechanism that they are using. And the government does not have control over those you know, gatherings. Yes, they can you know, send an agent you know, to one of them, but the Iranian people in my, my you know, case, I don't know, you know what you know, Turkey is or what, for example, Sudan is, the government, uh, the, the, the government could not did not succeed overall you know, to control and contain this mechanism. And that is very lucky. And that is a good thing for Iran. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to add to this question. I think it's, it's, it has both, both sides of the story. Um, now we, we know uh, the Turkish government could continue its regime and the power they use, they have, they have trolled uh, armies that, that they pay on payroll so they can form opinion in using Facebook, Twitter, mm -hmm. and other yeah. social media. So they are actually actively using it to continue their, their persecution and anti-democracy -democ uh, movement, right? But mm -hmm. at the same time, the, the journalists, I mean, all the, the opposition and free journalism is dead in Turkey. So most of the journalists who still have some integrity and, and either they're in Turkey, uh, they're on social media, on YouTube channels, uh, try, trying to do their job or in, in exile, they are trying to do their job. So yeah, there is, there is both sides of the story. You know, social media, thanks to God that we have access to it so we can actually get some, some you know, correct mm -hmm. information, mm -hmm. good information. But at the same time, you know, Turkish government is employing, you know, trolls yeah. Yeah. Uh, to form opinion to people. So I guess like any tools, like Brian said, you know, it's a tool it could be used for good things and it could be used for bad. And, you know, uh, and we see both sides happening, so. Yeah. Archer, how, how, is the, how is the social media in Sudan? Well, uh, during the revolution, they took the internet okay. down. So, you know, the government control and censors, uh, censor everything, basically. They find a way, when there is a will, there is a way. So people find a way That's to it. communicate, like you said, you know, um, Telegram and Clubhouse and even using Facebook and other mm -hmm. uh, social media. But the government definitely have an upper hand 
on using it to bully people to uh, spread false information and fear um like using the fear tactic with the activists with everyone who is speaking against the government uh, they also threat they have like uh Sait said an army that is bait uh, they mm -hmm. they have a, a name um uh, for them in sudan and those people are their their only job is to be online threaten spreading fear false information mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. on so i hope that answer your question um uh, dipti i guess you asked or someone thank you thank you uh mm -hmm. thank you to all the panelists for being with us today and now we'll conclude the conference with the conclusion by sahidi on behalf of the world affairs council First of all, I wanted to thank you all again for taking the time out of your rather busy schedules to speak or listen with us on pandemics and protests. We have been working so hard these past couple of months on organizing this conference, and I hope you've enjoyed the day so far. Now, on a final note, you may have noticed an overarching theme for all these topics we discussed today, and that theme is social media. Over the past couple of years, social media has boomed in popularity and has become an outstanding factor in pop culture. However, social media has also impacted so many other factors of society. As we had discussed earlier today, social media's effect on the coronavirus pandemic has left a lasting touch and, for most people, was their source for information on COVID-19. And while social media made it easy for people to get educated on all things COVID related, such as the disease itself and vaccines, there was and still is a major problem with the amount of misinformation on these social media sites. With high volumes of information being pumped out on social media daily, it was harder for people to realize what was fact or false. This made social media a major culprit of all the confusion about this deadly pandemic. On a side note, please make sure you get vaccinated to save yourself, your loved ones and your future. But protests have also been a prevalent topic on social media, especially since the Black Lives Matter movement was at its height during the summer of 2020. Social media was and has always been the easiest way to get information out, making it the best and fastest way to spread info on protests and educate people on major societal, environmental, and even political issues. Personally, I had observed how social media almost brought us together during a time of darkness. But unfortunately, also noticed how the hate on the streets transferred onto various social media apps and websites on which everyone was able to experience it. However, let's not forget social media's impact on world affairs across the globe. Because of social media's ability to perform a mass spread of news, it has become easier and easier every day for world affairs or world news to reach so many different people on so many different platforms. Additionally, this is both a positive and a negative thing as it gives easy access to people on what is happening in their world, but they also never truly know if what they're seeing or hearing is true. This is a shared issue we continue to see amongst different worldly issues and social media and is a game changing factor, especially when it comes to important subjects like this. To sum up, social media has affected so many different aspects of society, whether you notice it or not. And it comes to really show how powerful the media can be in such a variety of topics. Social media has connected the world on another level and has brought society even closer together than it has ever been, which is important to note. And with all that social media has been able to do over the years, there's no doubt that it's gonna change the world someday. Again, the World Affairs Council of Harrisburg's interns and I give our thanks to everyone who was either able to listen or participate in our discussion today. And I will now pass it over to Ms. Joyce Davis and Ms. Kate Barron for a few final remarks. Well, Sahidi, that was most profound. Thank you so much. And thank you, of course, to our dear panelists who closed this out, Hajar and Dr. Mehdi and Saeed. And of course, Brian's not here, but we thank you all so much. But really, I just want to personally give you all a round thank of applause. You. you have pulled off a major, a major conference. Absolutely. You should really be applauded. But I'm not going to say anything more except to say that you know, Sahiti, there wasn't always social media. <laughs> when I was growing up, there was no telephone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's I definitely didn't enough grow enough up with it either. Absolutely. <laughs> right. That did enough damage of its own. But with that, let me uh, now turn it over. I promised them that they would hear a closing word of encouragement 
from the president of the PA Media Group, my boss, and who's actually become my friend, Kate Barron. <laughs> Believe it or not, your boss can be your friend. <laughs> Absolutely, Hannah. Hey, thank you, Joyce. And more than a couple closing words, I'm afraid, but I'll, I'll try to keep it concise. That's all right. Go ahead. But I just really want to congratulate everybody on wrapping up the conference and really, you know, wrapping up the bulk of your summer internships with World Affairs. Uh, PA Media Group was delighted to be able to help sponsor this wonderful wonderful, rewarding program that I kept an eye on throughout the summer. You all made the most of the summer despite the limitations of the pandemic. And there's no question that when you can, when someone asks you what you did on your summer vacation, you will have a really good answer. Um, I did raise my hand to offer closing remarks because I love my conversation uh, back forward a couple weeks that when we talked about media literacy, I had a long drawn out talk ready to give you all, but you immediately jumped in you took command of the conversation. To that, I say bravo. You're all reporters in the making. Um, but think back on it. You had those exclusive live stream sessions with absolute tops in Pennsylvania government. The governor, my gosh, he gave you so much time. Attorney General's office, Patty Kim, and of course, Joyce's team of crack political commentators, Rosette Harris and Jeff Lord. And by the way, I hope you picked up in that conversation back in June with Jeff and Rochette, as, as Joy says, people can have wide, wide differences of opinion and still be so open to engaging with each other, being respectful and even liking each other and keeping the conversation going. But what I found was really impressive was how you learned by doing and took part, not just by sitting and listening. You wrote, you published columns on tough topics, including disinformation on Black Lives Matter, just this past Sunday, you did something on the need to challenge black students in school, climate change, food waste, uh, the list goes on. You were sharing your thoughts with hundreds of thousands of readers on Penn Live and in the Patriot News. And you shared your thoughts with me on the future of media and I wanted to thank you for that. But remember, don't always just listen to what the social media influencers tell you is true or best. Hopefully you'll be learning too to seek out trusted news. I applaud your efforts to get the word out on the vaccine. And I do wanna mention the wonderful podcast, The Interns. Great, amazing discussions, including the, I just, I just listened to the bonus episode yesterday about racism in sports. Um, I hope when you go back to high school or college, you take this spirit of engaging with the world with you, lean into the discussion, even if it's to say, I don't know. In fact, I heard that on the podcast yesterday and I was so impressed, impressed at your candor and honesty and the ability to say, I don't know when you don't. Think big thoughts, get involved, stay engaged. You've got that whole exciting future in front of you as everybody I know tells you. Your superpower is that you've raised your hand to be involved in the world. And boy, we need your brains and your passion and your commitment. And then one last word and I'll stop. The most valuable thing you'll take away from this summer internship, I know, are the connections that you've made with your fellow interns. You're now in a most valuable, powerful peer group that will benefit you throughout your lives. So please, please stay in touch with each other. Hold the magical bunch of people that you've met this summer close to you. You're gonna be a force to be reckoned with. I know we'll see a lot more of you in the future and thank you so much. <laughs>